In this episode of Video Fashion Style, fashion shows take on new meaning as designers stage runway spectacles with theatrical flair. The Blondes light up Broadway in a dazzling collaboration with Moulin Rouge, while Jeremy Scott conjures a pop culture fantasy on his Moschino runway. It's really just inspired by the idea of making a catwalk car wash. So I thought, what if I created a construction site and just kind of mass this car wash within it so I could do this unveiling surprise? Revisit the extraordinary show sets at Chanel and step into the video fashion archives for the late Terry Mugler's 20th anniversary retro spectacular. I want to show with beauty. I want to show the beauty through the age. I want to show the courage. Plus, Alexander McQueen reinvents the fashion show with a high-tech runway. Tom Brown takes us to the circus. And Rihanna delivers high-stake thrills for Fenty X Puma. We walked into these pink dunes where you felt like otherworldly. As the show started, these incredible motocross guys flying through the air at the armory. Fashion takes to the stage, next on Video Fashion Style. David and Philippe Blonde lit up Broadway with theatrical flair for an extraordinary show during New York Fashion Week. The Blondes collaborated with Moulin Rouge, creating one-of-a-kind pieces inspired by the hit movie turned Broadway show, and debuted the collection on stage at New York's historic L. Hirschfeld Theater. May we present you for this one night only our sparkling lives. Models joined the Broadway cast members on stage for a specially choreographed performance that merged fashion, song, and dance. Paris Hilton was one of the evening's star-studded surprises, arriving on stage via floating Eiffel Tower. Billy Porter helped close out the spectacular performance, a truly once-in-a-lifetime night at New York Fashion Week. At Moschino, it was hard to resist Jeremy Scott's infectious sense of humor when it came to the staging of his summer show. Moschino was just basically a riot. It was hilarious. It's one of the few shows that you go to during uh, Fashion Month, I should say, that where people literally break out into applause and like start cheering and hooting and hollering. It's definitely not your, your, your mother's fashion show. You know, Jeremy Scott is incredibly good at creating visuals for the internet age. You know, that was an immediately Instagrammable show.
It's really just inspired by the idea of making a catwalk car wash. I thought there's never been a car wash catwalk, and I thought this would be so much fun. I thought, but it's too much to do it for a whole show. It's going to get anticlimactic. So I thought, what if I created a construction site and just kind of mass this car wash within it, so no one would know, so I could do this unveiling surprise. He built a car wash. He built, he built a roadway. No runways, roadways. I think Jeremy uh, always puts on a really good show. It's always really fun. And I think when the car wash kind of like sudsing things like turned on and the bubbles started blowing, it just lifted the mood. You know, it's a really long day that day, uh, you know, a Thursday during the Lawn Fashion Week. To cap it off with just like really pure fun is always really great. I thought we were thinking about these sophisticated looks and these very chic ladies and these tailleurs and these little suit dresses and you know, this whole sophisticated look, but then in floral colors with the reflective material. Thinking about, you know, hard hats, but very chic and satin with veils and kind of mixing all these worlds. And then going into this whole idea of the, the car wash itself where I, you know, dresses that are like debutante ball gowns that are looking like vintage cars or, you know, the, the feather dresses that look like the, the buffing um, machines for the car and all that kind of stuff and just kind of make, make it fun and exciting. Moschina, I mean, I'm an absolute fan of Jeremy. He lives that vision. There's nothing apologetic or derivative about what he puts out there. It's what's in his head. It's what inspires him. You never feel like he's compromising. It's nice to see the models having fun as well. You know, they, they seem to happy to be walking that show. So I think it's going to be an incredibly uh, commercial collection because people are going to like swoop in and buy everything because it feels very limited, but it's just pure fun, pure Jeremy. What a triumph, what a way he's turned the label around from it being stuck in this rut to being transformed into this new dialogue about what's going on. So. Well done, Jeremy, I say. It feels wonderful. I feel so blessed and feel so touched that what I'm doing is reaching out to people and touching people. For me, my work is to touch people, is to be uh, connected to them. I don't really care about how many things are sold. I don't really care about the new skirt length. I care about touching people's heart. When I see that people are connecting with it and that they're having fun, they're drawing these illustrations of the collection and posting on Instagram and, and, and tagging me and, and, and they're having so much love for it. That's, to me, the, the end goal. Is, is having that, that kind of connection with people. To celebrate his 20th anniversary, Terry Mugler staged a theatrical spectacle as outrageous as his designs. Friends and fans gathered at the Cirque du Bear in Paris to enjoy his extravagant oath. one of the most wonderful designers because he not only designs fabric, but he designs, obviously, people's lives. It, it goes much broader than just a piece of fabric. Oh. He would say to me, you know, you but, the way he would interpret me, you know, you but more, you plus. So he wanted to, me to be the countess. And uh, so he said, you are Countess Lehndorf, which I am. And so I said, OK, we do it very cool. And he, we, we decided together that I'm doing nothing. I'm just walking there. Most of the time, it has to be sexy and glamorous. And sometimes he feel like, just feel wild, like the animal. Well, the corset went for me. It doesn't breathe. It's not made of elastic. And do you remember the women at the end of the last century when they had the vapors? Well, they were wearing Cherry Mugler's corsets. <laughs> they're so unique. I mean, they're almost avant-garde. They're so, so wonderful, and they're, they're very feminine. Everything is so feminine. I like that. His clothes are just so thrilling. Even the fantasy clothes are, are unique and marvelous. I love Cherry Mugler's um, brain. To be able to, to you know, uh, design these magnificent things. 
the spectacle celebrated the entire cast of Mugler's fashion characters. Sexy robots, showgirls, dominatrixes, glamour queens, and powerfully androgynous bomb fatales. I want to show with beauty. I want to show the beauty through the age. I want to show the courage. It's not that easy to be a woman, so I'm going to show it. In addition to his brilliant fashion, Karl Lagerfeld was known for staging his runways for the House of Chanel on awe-inducing sets. Here are just some of the most memorable Chanel shows. was extraordinary. To start with, we walked in to these pink dunes where you felt like otherworldly, right? And as the show started, these incredible motocross guys flying through the air at the armory. And to beat that were the clothes. The clothes were colorful, they had attitude, they were a mix of sporty but sexy. It was really a very upbeat show with great energy and great attitude. I love Rihanna. I love Rihanna's music. I love Rihanna's style. I'm a man of a particular age, but I still love Rihanna. And I continue to love what she does over and over and over again. And not because she's Rihanna, but because the clothes are actually super, uber, amazing and cool. Granted, there were motorcycles that were like flying over big piles of pink mountains and all sorts of theatrics. The clothes hold up to all of the drama that you see on the runway. The idea of all of this kind of safety strapping, the buckles, the belts, a lot of the idea of a lot of gathering and, and cording that's happening on the runway. She interpreted it in a super chic way with a lot of nylon, neon color, which I really am craving and I want more of. I think that she's really sort of found that sweet spot between creating, um, you know, putting her stardust on something and still letting the brand speak so that it feels like Puma and it feels like athletic wear, it feels like stuff that you'd want to wear, but it's also special and definitely cool. She delivers an amazing show. She does it the way that fashion wants it to be done, and she gives us really cool clothes that people want to wear. And only she can ride around a runway for her finale on the back of a motorcycle. It was literally a circus at Tom Brown's Fall 2008 show. Even the big top could barely contain Brown's clever creativity. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the craziest show on earth. It's loosely based on the circus, but it's never literally based on anything, but it's, it's always kind of crazy ideas that I have in my head. But I thought it was kind of cool to present it in an old American traveling circus. In men's clothing, I think it just adds a more masculine, kind of youthful, more playful side to it.
I developed a lot of argyle fabrics and then mixed them with really traditional American rep stripes. Navy and gray is a really strong story with gold buttons. I think it's very American. I adore going to Tom Brown's shows because he's one of those rare menswear designers who I think really takes the idea of designing for men quite seriously and believes that you can still embrace sort of the fundamentals of menswear and the history of menswear and still find a way to say something new with it and to challenge men. I like to take chances. I like to do things that people don't expect. I like to provoke new ideas, and I like to make people think. And I also like for people to have a good time. In this 1999 segment from the Video Fashion Archive, we caught up with celebrated Parisian producers Alec Batek and Violaine Etienne, who would meticulously plan and produce shows for designers. They are um, remarkable people. They've got taste, energy. They totally can interpret what a designer is thinking. We are seeing are there to either emphasize or translate what the main and newest part of the message is into all different areas that make a show, which is obviously the set, the location, the casting, the music, the light, the, every, you know, every different aspect, the mood, the, and all those different things. When you feel that the emotion that you are trying to uh, create is there, that's, for me, that's the best part. Before moving to New York, Alec and Violaine grew up friends in Paris, not knowing their mutual destiny. Violaine and I met actually pretty much 25 years ago. <laughs> it's a very long time ago. We met when we were in, how do you call it, kindergarten. And uh, we were in school together for like 12 years. Our job is basically a mix of what most people perceive as very glamorous relationships with fashion designers and journalists and models. And, but it's also very technical in many aspects of it. It's very challenging. It's very intense. It's very emotional. In those moments where you, you produce the shows, you have a very intense and specific relationship with the designers. When it's today and everything's going on, he really shines. He takes whatever themes or ideas that we have and takes them to the next step so they aren't so literal and really pushes them and he's not afraid to take chances. The idea is about, you know, waking, awaking the eye and awaking the ear and awaking the senses with every single detail you can use. Sometimes impact is made by, as I said, doing, like at Celine, doing just slight, doing perfection of something very simple. Every designer does a lot of things, but what they kind of want us to do is to highlight what they specifically are best at. I adore him. I mean, he's really great. He's, he's very supportive. He's always ca kind of looking out for the newness, and I think that's important. He always was an artist, even when he was a very little boy. She's remember very sincere, so it's quite funny. Like, she would come at the end of the show, and she'd be like, and like so? She's like, I hated it. <laughs> or like, she'd be like, oh yeah, it was beautiful. I advise everyone to bring their matters to the show. <laughs> On the last day of shows in Paris, the two masterminds finally took a break. It was tough because it was, you know, everything was so back to back. Um, but it was really good. So we're really happy. I mean, today's a good day. And we were looking forward for that date for like two months. It's a great day. It's sunny. We are done. <laughs> it's been a very long season. And, um, and hopefully, apparently, everything went very well. In 2009, Alexander McQueen took his show beyond the fashion flock and onto the internet, streaming live from Paris. I think the concept of live streaming, the horse may be out of the barn, 
So whether we think we need it or not, I think that increasingly designers at every level are looking to connect with the consumer directly. I mean, social networking has become huge in fashion, and this is a logical next step. We talked to some experts, and they, uh, many are very excited about the notion, but then there's the notion about, okay, you've already pushed the consumer toward the next season. What does that mean for this season? It was fantastic. It was great to uh, be there and, and see such an incredible transformation of what a fashion show is all about and uh, the transformation of the girls from uh, snakes to water and the clothes were amazing. Just to be a part of this was incredible. I think he's one of the most brilliant people working in fashion. I am in awe of his imagination, his skill level, his showmanship, and his talent as a designer. Um, it, it just blows me away. Some of my very, very favorite fashion moments happened at Alexander McQueen. One of the things I thought was really amazing about the clothes is that he just continues to push the boundaries really through the world of fabrics and trying to get fabrics to do different things, to be sheer and then to be solid all at once, to drape, to be structured. So and that was starting to happen in a big way, in kind of a contemporary way. Alexander McQueen has two distinct directions. He can be very dark and brooding, and he can be very, very romantic. And sometimes he fuses the two of them. I think it's important, you know, especially in dealing when you're going directly to the consumer and a consumer who may not be all that familiar. I mean, he's, he's very famous, but still, there's sometimes a, a, a limited reach, perhaps. But I would have liked to have seen him show more a, a broader range of, of what he does, because what he does is really exquisite, and it translates so beautifully to real clothes. And I think that that message, perhaps, did not come across as clearly as it could have. If anyone else, else attempted to do a theme like that, like a galactic te theme, it, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't translate like that. He's the one who can do this, and, and it's, it's global, it's fantastic. The new media has really changed the way business is being done, and fashion has been in a way, I, I wouldn't want to say, I don't want to say late to this, but because it's still in its infancy, but uh, you know, five, seven years ago, we weren't all so aware of just how dramatically this is going to change everything. These designers took fashion shows to the next level and truly made an art out of sharing their creative visions with the world. <laughs>